Hi, everyone. So before I start talking about color, I'll give you a little history. Because Front Trends is a conference that's very special to me. I still remember uh, when Damian first invited me to the very first Front Trends. And I had never spoken at a conference before. Heck, I had never even been to a conference at the time. So he sent me an email and he was like, we want to make the best conference in Central and Eastern Europe. And we're very excited about it. It's difficult to organize because we can't find sponsors, but we really want to make this happen. And I had never gotten an invitation to speak at a conference before. So my first thought was, somebody's pulling a prank on me. This, this, can't be, this can't be right. Why would somebody want me to speak at a conference? I was just a developer with a blog at the time. I hadn't really done much. I just had a company in Greece. I was living in Greece. I, 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 I hadn't done much open source work. Uh, but I, 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 and, and I was really nervous about it. But I still, I still said yes. Uh, and this was the, the website of the first Front Trends conference. It's come a long way, and we've both come a long way, both Front Trends and me. That's how I looked at the time I was going through my blonde phase. And this was the cover of my first talk, I, I, which I changed so many times before, uh, before that Front Trends. And it was a two-hour talk. Imagine if your first ever talk at a conference has to be two hours. I was so nervous, and it was exhausting. Uh, but it, it went really well. Uh, this was my introduction slide. I, I mentioned that I live in Greece, this is my company, uh, and stuff like that. And now, Front Trends, uh, this is the fourth Front Trends. And not only it is the best conference, in my opinion, in, in Central and Eastern Europe, but I think it's one of the best Front Trends, front, front and conferences in the world. So not only they've achieved their, their initial goal, but they went much further than that, and it's improving every year. It's one of the conferences I really enjoy going to. And I've come a long way as well. Uh, in, the, in, 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 in those four years, I, I, worked on many op I started many open source projects. Some of you told me yesterday that you use my work, which feels great. Uh, Prism.js is a syntax highlighter that's used on many big websites. Doublet is a... CSS, HTML, and JavaScript prototyping tool. Prefix Free is a library that automatically adds prefixes. I worked at W3C for a year in the meantime. I, I became an invited expert in the CSS working group. I, I'm, not, I'm now writing a book for O'Reilly, which hopefully will be released in late 2014. And in September, I'm starting at MIT uh, doing research towards a PhD. So it's really exciting to see how we both uh, both me and Frontrends evolved, and they've give, they keep inviting me every year since, because they're like, you were at my, our first Frontrends, and you, it was your first talk, and we can't Im Im imagine Frontrends without you, and I think it's really sweet, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about something more interesting, like Color on the Web. Uh, so, firstly, how Color works on screen. Uh, sorry. This is a white pixel, a really big white pixel. And this is how most people imagine a white pixel. However, the reality is a bit different, and it looks more like this. And actually, in our LCD screens, it looks more like this. And you might be wondering, how on earth is this a white pixel? This is just red, green, and blue. These are called subpixels, and every, every color that's displayed on your screen is is combined by, uh, is made through uh, lighting each of those subpixels with a different intensity. White is all these subpixels at full intensity. So you might be wondering, how do these create white? And yes, when you see them at such a big magnification level, they just seem like three colors. But if you start going further and further away and the pixels become smaller, your eyes start blending them together into one color. And if this, uh, and now it's starting to blend uh, to create sort of a grayish thing, but in our screens, it, it act, they, they actually blend together to create white, but this is just a shitty CSS uh, and HTML animation, which is why it doesn't look like white. But if you, if you take a photo of a screen and you zoom it uh, at a large enough level, this is how it looks. You can, you can start seeing the subpixels. And this is why RGB is called an additive color model, because if you, if you combine all, the all its components together at full intensity, they create white. 
And this is how uh, some main colors look when you examine them when you examine them at the subpixel level. For example, to create orange, you have red at full intensity, uh, green at like 50% intensity, and blue is completely turned off. And this, the, the subpixel geometry of every screen is different depending on this on, on the type of screen you have. This is the, the LCD screen I showed you, but CRT screens have a different subpixel geometry, as you can see here. Uh, or a CRT that's for a TV is even different. And this, this one, the XO1 LCD, is the screen for that project called One Laptop Per Child, the $100 laptop that they gave to children in poor countries. So, and as you can see, the subpixel geometry in this one is a bit strange because it doesn't really have subpixels. Every pixel is only one component, either red or green or blue. And uh, to, 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 to display a specific color, uh, you need to combine not just one pixel, but also the pixels around it, which is why the resolution of that screen depends on the, the, the viewing angle, which is really strange and interesting, I think. And they managed to cut costs quite a bit by, uh, by that innovation. Even with LCD screens, the subpixel geometry is not exactly the same. You can see here how it looks for, for popular devices. So, unless you're using your screen to only display pixel art, you eventually run into the, ca the case where you want to display a graphic that falls on half pixels or 30% of a pixel, like, for example, when you want to display a diamond like this. You can see that, for example, here, this pixel is only 50% covered. So how do you show this? There are two different ways, and uh, th displaying this kind of thing is called uh, anti-aliasing. Uh, the basic anti-aliasing algorithm, called grayscale anti-aliasing, is dimming every pixel depending on how much it's covered. For example, in this case, a white pixel is 50% covered, so all its, its red, green, blue components are only lit by 50%. And this pixel here was 100% covered, so it's, it's fully lit. Uh, a few years after this algorithm, there, they, they realized that they can take advantage of the fact that every pixel is composed of subpixels to triple the horizontal resolution of the screen. So uh, depending on where uh, the, par the covered part of a pixel lies, you, you light up different parts of the subpixel, and it looks like this. This creates much crisper graphics, although in, it has some issues in, in, in some cases. You, uh, you most commonly see subpixel anti-aliasing in fonts. This is uh, a demo that a guy called John Daggett made where you can see how the subpixels work. And I'm sure that at some point in your geek lives, you've, you've uh, zoomed in and saw that uh, every font has different colored pixels on each side, even though the color of the font might be just black or white. And you might, be, and you might have wondered why or where did all these different colors came from? And the reason is subpixel anti-aliasing. This is how the, the covered areas of the subpixels look like if you grayscale the whole thing. However, depending on which areas of subpixels are lit, they create different colors, which is why you see all these different colors. Browsers uh, have given us proprietary ways to turn off uh, subpixel anti-aliasing, which is uh, uh, not very useful in typical cases of fonts. Uh, and please don't do it. In most cases, you really don't need it, and it's proprietary. and it's awful, but in some cases, when you have, for example, an, uh, an icon font, it can end up blurring it, which is why you have a way to turn it off. Unfortunately, there's no standard way yet. There was one in an early version of the font spec, but it was removed. So most of us don't work uh, with color at that level. Most of us work with color on the, on the CSS level. Uh, so this is, again, our friend, the subpixel. You can see how every subpixel occupies eight bits, and this is just the general case. There are always exceptions. But in the general case, the most common case, every subpixel occupies eight bits, which means we can have two to the eighth states, which means we can have 256 states, which means we can have now every, uh, every subpixel can range from zero to 255 in its intensity which is why RGB is typically defined from 0 to 255. 
And that's why uh, early implementations of RGB uh, taught us to use RGB in that range, even though it's not so friendly for humans and it's mostly friendly to, the, to machines. This also means that every pixel occupies 24 bits, which is three bytes per pixel, which you can easily verify in uh, uncompressed images, for example, bitmap images. If you take any random bitmap image and you, uh, and you multiply the width by the height by three, you will end up with something that's really close to the size of the image. It's, it won't be exactly the same because they also have metadata, but it, it, it will be very close to that. Which also means we can create 256 to the third possible colors, which is about 16.7 million. The RGB color system is often defined, uh, is often uh, depicted as a cube. With uh, when all the coordinates are 255, you get white. When they are all zero, you get black. And the, and every color space has a, a geometrical representation like this. It's a cube for RGB. You will see later that it it can be different for other color spaces. And uh, the geometrical representation of a color space can be interesting for things like uh, measuring distance between two colors. However, in our screens, we usually uh, I I depicting something as a cube is not very useful because our screens are two-dimensional. So what do we do when we have to depict a, th a three-dimensional coordinate system on a, on a two-dimensional space? We just keep one dimension constant, and we, sh we show the other one as a two-dimensional plane. You you've certainly seen color pickers that are like this. And this is the most, uh, if you have to select a color in RGB, this is probably the most efficient way to do it, because uh, at least you get all the possible colors in a two-dimensional plane, uh, whereas there are other color pickers that have three sliders, and they're, really, uh, they're not very practical because they basically flatten the entire thing. You don't even get a two-dimensional plane. You just get three single dimensions. So it's really difficult to visualize colors that way. However, even with this kind of, of representation, by the way, uh, this is just an HTML, CSS, JavaScript application. My slides are online, so you can play with this yourselves later. Uh, even with this kind of representation, RGB is not a very intuitive system for humans. For example, how on earth uh, does somebody define brown with RGB? You, it's, it's not very obvious that you have to like reduce red and go somewhere around here. And is this brown yet? Not quite. So. Eventually, we, we tried to come up with better ways to define colors. And, even there, and there are even more coming in CSS Color Level 4, as we'll see later in this talk. But just it's an interesting exercise to just try to find a brown color. It's actually pretty difficult. So before I show you what's coming in CSS Color Level 4, let's, go, uh, let's talk a little bit about history. We first got colors in web applications, in HTML, 3.2. And back then, the only color formats we had were two. The main one was hex colors, which is why hex colors stuck with us so much, even though they're really, they're the less intuitive, the least intuitive way for humans to define colors, but it was the first way we got. So I'm sure you've all used hex colors tons of times. You know that the first two digits are the red component, the, second, uh, the third and the fourth are the, the green component, the last two are the blue component, and for example, this color is equivalent to this RGB uh, color, which is this, which is one of my favorite colors. Uh, however, nobody thinks about hex colors like, okay, so I have this RGB color, which is 255, which is FF in hex, and then the zero would be zero, zero, and what about 90? Okay, let's think 90 is five times 16 plus 10, 5A, so yeah, we, uh, it would be FF 005A. That's no one, ever. Nobody thinks like this. Nobody even uses the console to convert between hex and decimal, uh, even though it's just one line. It's this simple. What most of us end up doing is using a color picker to pick some uh, and copying the hex value. And then if we want to modify it, like make it darker, we, we're too lazy to go back to the color picker. So we just start fiddling with colors with, uh, uh, from the CSS file. And we're like, OK, how do I make this darker? Oh, I'll just subtract the same amount. Like, let's, let's try subtracting 20, uh, 22 from each of them. So this will become like this. Is it dark enough yet? Uh, no, let's subtract a little more. And, and then 
you get a color that's not even ex the, the same hue as the one you had before, but it's good enough, so we usually go by with it. This is how, this is how uh, used we are to hex colors, even these days. Oh, and, and in HTML 3.2, we also got named colors, these 16 named colors, which are pretty useless. And if you're wondering where they came from, they came from the Windows VGA palette. Do you remember the days of, the win of Windows 95 and when you had to restart in safe mode and uh, it, it, it was a 16 colors display? It was these 16 colors. This was that awful teal that, they, that it had as a desktop background. So to sum up, in HTML 3.2, we got hex colors, which are confusing and cryptic because A, RGB is confusing for humans, and it has an extra step of converting decimal to hex, which makes it even more confusing, and color names that were pretty useless. So then, came, uh, then CSS came along. CSS actually came along uh, about the, uh, like a year later after, CSS, uh, after HTML 3.2, but we started using it many, many years later because browsers didn't support it immediately. And CSS 1 to 2.1 gave us some new color formats, but not as many as we needed. One of them was the decimal RGB notation, which was slightly easier than hex, but still not very intuitive because it was RGB. And at that point, we were so used to hex that it never really caught on. Not many people use it. We, they tried to give us a slightly more human-friendly RGB notation, and it is supported by every browser, but we still not, don't use it very much, exactly because we're so used to hex colors. We got three-letter hex codes, which this one uh, just expands to this, which were just a more compact way to, def to, to express some hex colors, and minifiers use them today uh, a lot. And we also got the named color orange, which was probably the most useful thing we got. But yeah, we got one more named color. So to sum up, in CSS 1 to 2.1, we got the RGB functional notation, slightly better than hex, but still confusing. And it was quite verbose, so it didn't really catch on. We got a shorter hex notation for some hex colors and the orange named color. I actually made a game when I was making this talk called What the Color, in which it gives you a color and you have to write uh, a, a, a CSS color to match it. And I'm not, my original intention was to play this game during my talk to demonstrate how difficult uh, RGB colors are and how much easier other color formats are. But I eventually realized that it's not very practical to play a game during my talk because it's not exactly easy to concentrate on stage on playing a game. But I still, I still recommend that you try it at home because it can be quite fun, even though it's kind of difficult, as you can see, especially with RGB. But try to time yourself when using RGB and when using other color formats, uh, and you'll see how other color formats are much better. OK, I got to 90%. I should probably stop now. Yeah, OK, whatever. Moving on. Yes, Leah, change the slide. OK, as you can see, it's quite addictive. And then came CSS Color Level 3. Before I, I uh, explain, uh, before I remind you what we got with CSS Color Level 3, uh, this is a little JavaScript that I will use throughout this talk every time I'm describing an algorithm. At this point, it doesn't really do anything. It's just a simple JavaScript class. And classes and codes, because you, you all know you don't really have classes in JavaScript. But it works like a class. You create color objects. Uh, they have methods. They have getters and setters. Uh, and this is the basic scaffolding behind all the methods I'm going to show. They, they all hook onto this class. Uh, and it enables you to create, or to create color objects this way, either by providing a, an RGBA array, or uh, by, set, by using the RGB, uh, or by setting the RGB array uh, explicitly. And then you can add methods to it. Like, for example, if you wanted to add an invert method, uh, you, just, uh, you just add a function that goes through every component and 
subtracts it from, subtracts it from 255, which is basically how you invert RGB colors, how you get, uh, if you have red, for example, you get aqua. So it's pretty useless at this point, but you, uh, you'll see how we can add functions to it to make it more, do more interesting stuff later on. So in CSS color level three, and notice how I'm not saying CSS3 because CSS3 doesn't really exist. After CSS 2.1, it was all split into multiple modules, and each of them have had its own versioning. Some of them even start from level one. But CSS Scholar started from level three because it expanded on concepts introduced in CSS 2.1. So we got another color system to define colors, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Uh, and it was supposed to be more human friendly, but it's, it has its issues, as we'll see later on. Uh, it, it's, it was also a three-coordinate system. Uh, its first coordinate was hue, which is an angle, uh, which is expressed in angles, and it, it, it means hue expresses what's the basic color that you're dealing with. Is it red? Is it orange? Is it blue? Is it green? Then there's saturation, which is how gray it is. Uh, saturation zero means it's completely gray. Saturation 100 means it's a really bright color. And lightness means how close it is to, red, to, to white or black. As you can see, for example, uh, if, I want to, uh, if, if I want to find a brown color, it becomes much easier because I can instantly see it's somewhere around here. And then I, uh, it's obviously darker than this, so I reduce the, the lightness, and then maybe I move it a little bit. And there, I, I got a brown. So try defining this with RGB. And this, was the, this is the notation in... Uh, in, in uh, CSS, the first coordinate is angles. You can even have negative angles, which are equivalent to this. And as you change the hue, you change the color, and then you can increase saturation or lightness. HSL is, uh, HSL's geometrical representation is a double cone. Here, I'm only showing half of it, because if I was showing the double cone, uh, it, wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be very easy to see. Uh, this is the part of HSL for that, that's um, from lightness 0 to 50%. And you might be wondering, why is it a cone? Okay, I, uh, I can get why, why it's a cylinder, because it's an angle plus two other coordinates, but why a cone? It's a cone because uh, as you're moving towards lightness of 0 or lightness of 100, you get fewer and fewer colors. The number of, colors, the number of possible colors uh, when you have a low lightness are much fewer than the number of possible colors when uh, you have a lightness of 50%. And when you have a lightness of zero, you only get one possible color, regardless of what your hue and saturation is, you only get black. Which is why you start getting fewer and fewer colors as you move towards zero, and only one point when you're exactly at zero. And this is the game again, it's much easier when you're dealing with HSL, uh, you can probably tell that this is somewhere around here for its hue. And let's try 50% for saturation because it's not very bright. Uh, it should be a bit closer to, b to blue and darker. And even closer to blue. So... Uh, if you try this at home, you can see that it's much, much easier with HSL, even though it doesn't look like it, because things are always different on stage. See, I've always got it in like a few seconds. And knowing how HSL works is not just useful for defining colors, but also uh, for other things like filters. So I'm going to switch to Chrome now, because Firefox doesn't support filters yet, not at, at least not with this. Not with this nice syntax. It supports SVG filters, which are basically the same thing. But this, no, uh, this notation is much easier. Uh, in case you're not familiar with CSS filters, it's a new specification uh, where you can define uh, nice effects on elements, for example, like grayscale, as easily as just defining a few functions. Uh, and there's a filter called uh, sepia which makes your element sepia, which is basically uh, to uh, desaturated tones of yellow. And if you use, uh, so the hue rotate filter, 
takes a parameter that's an angle and adds this, uh, this amount of degrees to, every, to, the, to the hue value of every pixel in your image. So if I add 60, for example, and I have a yellow in my image, which, is, uh, six, which has a hue of 60, it will become green. And which is, which is why this image started to become greenish, because um, the original image had lots of yellow tones. And the, yeah, hue rotate is not very useful on its own. Who, why would you want to give this effect to your, to, to your image? But it becomes really uh, useful in combination with other filters. For example, uh, if you use the sepia filter that I showed earlier, and you use a saturate filter, which in increases the saturation of every pixel uh, in your image. So sepia makes, it, uh, makes every pixel in the image a desaturated yellow. Uh, so saturate uh, in in increases the saturation. And then if you use, so now you, you have a, a, an image that's yellow, and all, all its pixels are uh, sort of saturated yellow. So if you use hue rotate, you can basically colorize the image. So now it's, it, now it's yellow. If I want to make it green, I would use a hue rotate of 60 degrees. If I want to make it bluish, I would add a hue rotate of 180, and so on. You can see how I can give it different colors based on how many degrees I add. There is a, there's, an even, there's also another way to colorize images. Let's go back to Firefox. And it's using blend modes. How many of you have used blending modes in, in Photoshop? About half of you. So you're probably familiar with blending modes. Here I've used uh, the same background of, of the baby. On top of this pink. And I've given uh, the background image a blending mode of multiply, so it's blended on the pink I have which creates this effect. You might be wondering though, okay, I colorized the image and I made it pink, but it's also much darker than it used to be. Why is that? So this becomes clearer uh, when we learn how the multiply blending mode is defined. So the multiply blending mode is basically, uh, you take every, com every RGB component of, your, of, of both your colors, you convert it to the range of zero to one, which is what dividing it by 255 does, and then you multiply those two components together, and then you convert the result to the, to the 0 to, 50, to 255 scale. So this is how you would add a method that multiplies two colors in the color class we discussed earlier. This means that uh, if, you have colors that are, if you have color components that are close to 0, they, they, they influence every, other, every, every color you multiply them with. For example, here's uh, here's how you, do, you, you, you would define, you would create a red color object and a blue color object. Can you think of what the result of the multiply operation would be on, on red uh, and blue? If you think about it, the 255 of red would be multiplied by the zero here, so you would end up with zero. Then these two zeros would be multiplied together, so you would end up with zero for green as well. Then zero would be multiplied with this, which would be zero times one, because it needs to be on the zero to one scale, so you would also end up with zero. So basically, you would end up with black. So multiplying uh, two colors together always ends up with a color that's either as light as your darker color or even darker. Uh, by the way, blending modes are, uh, there are experimental implementations of blending modes today in Firefox and uh, WebKit and Blink which is Safari and Chrome. So basically every browser except IE has an experimental implementation of them. And it's not just multiply. Uh, you, you, we also get all the blending modes we know from Photoshop. And yes, I know it, they look awful here, but designers have been using them in Photoshop for years and creating pretty stuff. This is just the example from the spec. And yes, I agree that specs should have more useful examples, but at least this demonstrates how they work. So you might be wondering, what's the problem with HSL? I mentioned, the, I, I mentioned in the beginning that it has some issues. Can you see what's the problem here? So here we have two colors, yellow and blue. 
Yellow is a really light color, blue is a quite dark color, but they both have a lightness of 50%. So, lightness doesn't exactly work the way we would expect it to work. How can these two colors have the same lightness? And the reason for that is called perceptual uniformity. We say that a color space has perceptual uniformity when the perceptual similarity of two colors is measured by the distance between them. Remember the RGB cube in the beginning? If the RGB color space was perceptually uniform, measuring the Euclidean distance between two points in the cube would give us the, dif the color difference uh, between two colors, but it doesn't. Because RGB is not perceptually uniform. And since HSL is basically a transformation of RGB, HSL is not perceptually uniform either. You can see the same issue here uh, with RGB colors this time. The first color and the third color have exactly the same distance from the, middle co from the second color. Both have a distance of 128. We can see it in the RGB cube here. No, don't spin. Uh, so, the, the middle color is this one, this pure magenta, and the first color is about here, and the third color is about here. So you can see they both have the same distance from the corner. However, the, the perceptual difference between them is not the same at all. The, two, the first two are much more similar to, our, to the human eye than the second is to the third. The reason for that, uh, so I li like I said, HSL is not perceptually uniform, so we can't really use it to detect how light or, or, or dark a color is. So assume we wanted to, we had a random color and we wanted to detect whether we should put black or white text on it. Getting the lightness, uh, and a, a naive way to do it would be get, calculating the lightness of the color, and if it's above 50, we would we would use black. If it's below 50, we would use white text on it. But like we saw earlier, this uh, wouldn't yield very good results. The reason for that is uh, is more. The reason for that can be seen here when we, we when we examine how lightness is actually defined. This is how uh, this is exactly how HSL lightness is defined. You get the maximum of the RGB components, or you get the minimum of the RGB components. And then you get the average of the two. It doesn't matter whether the maximum is blue or green or red. Uh, even though our eyes are much more sensitive to blue than they are to red, and much more sensitive to red than they are to green, which is why we, we see blue as darker than red and red as darker than green. But lightness doesn't account for this at all. It just, it just gets uh, the average of the minimum and maximum, which is why it gives exactly the same lightness for blue and yellow, because they both have uh, the, the same minimum and the same maximum. There is another metric called relative luminance, which is not perfect, but at least it's not as bad as, as HSL lightness. This is the formula for, from the Web Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, and I obviously don't expect you to read the whole algorithm now, but I've included it to show you that it's not anything comp super complicated. You just go over every RGB component, you do some math, math, some math with them, and then you return a wide a weight average of the three. And as you can see here, the blue uh, component is multiplied by a number that's much smaller than the number you multiply the red component with, which is in turn much smaller than the number you multiply the green component with. So at least relative luminance accounts for that difference between the three components. And you can see here uh, how these two metrics work. Uh, for example, for this fuchsia color, Luminance is 22%, which is much closer than what we would expect. Lightness is steady at 50%. Same with yellow. When we have yellow, luminance is 93%, which, is, uh, much, which, 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 which reflects our impression of the color much more accurately than lightness, which you can see is 50%. And you can see how our, our algorithm would fail really badly, because you can't even read the text here. So this, this, part, of the, this part of this demo is using lightness to determine the text color, and this part of the demo is using luminance to determine the text color. And similarly, if I have blue, you can see how... Uh, this is pure RGB blue. You can see how luminance is 7%, which shows us that it's a dark color, and lightness is just steady at 
However, luminance is not perfect. Uh, and its, its issues become more apparent as you're moving towards red. So here you get 73%, which is what you'd expect. Uh, but as I start moving toward, towards oranges, you can see how luminance starts dropping because red is darker than yellow, so it makes sense to drop. So here it would give us 45% and we would end up having uh, and we would end up having white text, even though it would be a better strategy to have black text because this orange is a, ra is a rather light color. You can't see it very well in the projector because it doesn't show the colors very well, but it's, it's, it's a quite light color. So luminance isn't perfect, but at least it won't fail as miserably as lightness does. Remember, it will, luminance will never do this. And you might be wondering why there's an algorithm for relative luminance in the accessibility guidelines. The reason is that the color contrast definition uses it. So once you have luminance, this is how you define color contrast. You just add a little bit to each luminance so that you, and you get the ratio between them. You, uh, the reason you add 0 0.05 is so that you don't end up dividing by zero. But it's basically the ratio of the two luminances. And when I was working at W3C, uh, I ha everything we made had to pass the accessibility guidelines, and I'm sure uh, that's, and that's the case with many people that work on like government websites. Uh, there are sometimes accessibility um, baselines that you have to pass. So I, I started using the color contrast tools that already existed out there, and most of them, ex all of them, expected a, a, a hex color. So I had to convert my HSL colors to hex. Uh, calculate the contrast between them, then convert them back to HSL, sometimes adjust them if they didn't pass, then convert them back. And it, at some point I got fed up and made my own tool which accepts every CSS color. And it was, uh, you can see how uh, it accepts even named colors, even semi-transparent colors, and uh, there was no defined way to get the contrast ratio between semi-transparent colors. Uh, so I had to do my own research for that. And it's easy when you have a text color that's semi-transparent on an opaque background, because then uh, the semi-transparent color just becomes a, an opaque color on the white background, for example. But when your background is semi-transparent, you can't really calculate a single contrast ratio. You have a range of possible contrast ratios be depending on what's underneath. And the less your opacity, the bigger the range. So that was something I had to figure out by myself because there was nothing in the web accessibility guidelines about it. Uh, and when I asked in the accessibility mailing list, they were like, what, semi-transparent colors? What's that? Because uh, uh, most accessibility people aren't super technical. So um, speaking of semi-transparent colors, one of the color formats we got in CSS Level, color level three was semi-transparent colors, and every developer was super excited about them. We got RGBA colors, we got HSLA colors. Um, uh, and they were like all the rage back in, back uh, like three years ago or four years ago. Have you ever wondered how semi-transparent colors work? Because they're just an abstraction. Uh, our, our screens don't have semi-transparent subpixels. What would you see? What's behind the screen, all the circuits? So eventually, all your semi-transparent colors need to be composited into an opaque color by a process called alpha blending. And alpha blending works, works a little bit like this. Uh, you, you iterate over every color component, every RGB component. You multiply it by its own alpha transparency, and then you add uh, every the, the, the corresponding color component of the color underneath, you multiply it by its own alpha transparency and by one minus the alpha transparency of the color underneath. And obviously your alpha uh, increases. Which is similar to how you get the average between two colors, which is called color interpolation, uh, which, is basic, which is basically a fancy technical term to mean how you get uh, colors that are between 
uh, to other colors. For example, uh, how do you get a color that's 30% your first color and 70% your second color? Or how do you get a color that's the average of your two colors? Uh, and basically, you just loop, through, uh, loop over every component, you multiply it by the weight, and then you add the second component multiplied by one minus your weight, which is 50% which is for both, uh, if you just want to calculate the average. And if you're using SAS, this is built in. Uh, there's a function called mix, which does exactly this. It gets two colors and a weight, and gives you the corresponding color. Color interpolation is used uh, when uh, your browser is calculating CSS transitions, when you're, for example, when you hover over something and the color changes for like, from like red to green or whatever. And it's also used in gradients. And it's pretty simple to calculate it when you have a gradient from uh, between two opaque colors, for example, white to black or yellow to black or whatever. But what happens when you have, for example, white to transparent? It might not be very obvious here, but it will become, the problem will become even more obvious when I add white. As you can see, this is not fully white. This is fully white. This gradient has some gray in between, which is strange because I have a gradient from white to transparent on white. Where did the gray come from? The reason for this is that transparent is just a shorthand to transparent black which is RGBA 0, 0, 0, 0. So while my color is transitioning from opaque to transparent, it's also transitioning from white to black. So you can see how the intermediate states look here. For example, the color at 50% of the gradient is a, is a semi-transparent gray. So uh, to make sure that, that you have a gradient from white to transparent, you have to use transparent white instead of just uh, the transparent keyword. However, um, when, uh, when the CSS working group realized uh, that authors were using transparent ingredients and they ended up with this, uh, they changed the specification to use what's called a pre-multiplied RGBA space, which, is, uh, which sounds complicated, but it's actually that every color is stored multiplied by its alpha, by its alpha, by its alpha transparency. So there's no transparent black anymore, there's just transparent colors. So in Chrome, even this first gradient is, uh, these two gradients are the same in Chrome, but Firefox hasn't caught up yet. So if you want your gradient to, to show in the way you expect in every browser, you still need to use transparent white. We all, in CSS color level four, we also got more named colors, which aren't exactly evenly distributed, aren't exactly practical. You can see how, the, how weird and long they are or how weird the naming is, like, seriously, old lace? Who thinks of colors that way? Sometimes they're even racist. <laughs> and other times it's just completely insane. <laughs> I'm not making this up. This is actually how gray and dark gray look. The reason for that is that we got gray before we got dark gray. So uh, these, uh, these new color names came from SVG, and SVG got them from X11, but we already had these 16 colors from HTML 3.2, so we already had a gray that was defined like this. X11 also had a gray which was lighter than this dark gray, but we couldn't change gray because websites were using it, so we just got dark gray, and we ended up with a dark gray that's lighter than gray. We also got a really a, another color keyword which, is, which works in a different way than the existing color keywords. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed that if you have a border without uh, a color, it gets the text color automatically, and you can even change the text color and it adjusts automatically. There are many functions that have the same behavior. For example, box shadow. If you specify a box shadow without a color, it gets the text color. And if you change the text color, it's dynamic. So until recently, there was no, uh, there are many other properties that have uh, this behavior. Text shadow is the same. Uh, and until recently, there was no way to uh, it, there was no way to say to, to explicitly have this behavior in the specs. It was just specified like if there's no color, you get the text color. Uh, we don't really like this kind of thing in uh, CSS specs. We want 
initial values to be able to be represented in CSS. So we borrowed uh, this color keyword from SVG that's called current color, which has exactly the same behavior, but now we can use it everywhere a color can be used. So for example, we can even use it in backgrounds. We can have a gradient from current color to transparent. And we can even use it to have things like stripes. Like this. And then you can change the text color and it adjusts automatically, which is basically the first variable we ever got in CSS. Sure, it's limited, but it's the first variable we ever got in CSS and it's supported by every browser today. Not i8, but every other browser today. And yes, proper CSS variables are coming soon, but until then, current color can be quite useful, for example, in decorations where you can define a main color through the color property and use current color everywhere else, so you only change it in one place. So to sum up, in CSS color level three, we got the HSL notation, which was better, but not great. Uh, we got RGBA and HSLA, which were badly needed. More color names, still mostly useless, and current color that was cool but limited. And the, the future is CSS color level four, and everything I will say to you here is very tentative because it's still a draft, and everything might change. But we're going to get lots of really cool features. Uh, the first thing, and one of the most certain features, is that gray will become a function. So the gray keyword will be equivalent to, to gray 50%, but then we'll be able to define anything from black to white by just using gray in a percentage. Or uh, a value like 200, yeah, I haven't implemented that, because this is JavaScript now. It's not supported by any browser, so I just had to use JavaScript to emulate them. Uh, we're also, it's also going to have alpha values as a, as a second parameter. So basically, most of the colors we use on websites today will be able to be represented with the gray keyword, because most of them are white, black, and transparent versions of them. Uh, you can emulate the gray function with SAS today just by one line of code, and then it's exactly the same syntax as what we'll get in CSS. We'll also get four-digit hex codes, which are exactly the same as the, their six-digit counterparts, plus an alpha value, but which ranges from zero, which is completely transparent, to F, which means 100% uh, opaque. And of course, we will also get eight-digit hex codes, which will look something like this. I don't know why people want this, because it looks like a fucking serial number, <laughs> but people have been asking for it for ages, so we, we caved in and added it. We will also get a new color system called HWB, which should not be confused with the HSB that Photoshop supports. It will be, it's, it's different, and it works like this. Uh, you choose a hue, the hue is the same uh, as in HSL, and then you, you whiten it by mixing it with white, you darken it by mixing it with black, and it's better to see it this way. So you, add, you, uh, you darken it by mixing it with black. HWB starts, stands for hue, whiteness, blackness, exactly because it's hue, then how much you mix it with white and how much you mix it with black. And you create grays by having uh, a whiteness and blackness that add to a hundred, uh, that add to a hundred percent, like this. And depending on what's the, what's the ratio between them, you get darker or lighter grays. You can emulate HSB with SAS, exactly the same syntax as what we're going to get in CSS, but just a few lines of code. And then you can use HWB colors, and, and, and SAS will take care of converting them to colors the browsers understand today. We will also get a color function that will, that, uh, will enable you to do all sorts of color manipulation. Here I'm just using uh, color keywords, but Imagine the power when we get color variable uh, when we get CSS variables, which are also coming. So you can use the tint function to mix it with white. You can use the shade function to mix it with black. You can even use the blend adjuster to mix it with another color, which can also be a variable when we get CSS variables. 
And there aren't even just these three adjusters. There are so many more. You can do anything with colors with the color function. I'm hoping the syntax will change because so many parentheses, it, makes, it, it ends up looking like Lisp. But I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping the syntax will change, but we'll, 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 that the power of color still makes it through because it's, it's a really amazing thing to look forward to. Uh, even though you can't emulate the color function with SAS because the syntax is really complicated, you can emulate the tint and shade adjusters, for example. And specifically, tint and shade are already included in Bourbon, which was the inspiration for uh, including them in CSS color level four. And there's a preprocessor called Methio that already supports the color function, so you can play with it. And this is uh, what's coming in CSS color level four to sum up the gray function. Uh, uh, four digit, four and eight digit hex colors, HWB. The color function uh, will also get named hues and angles in HSL, like yellow instead of 60, or 60 deg instead of 60. And we'll also be able to add, to use alpha values in RGB and HSL. Uh, so we won't have to change the function name to RGBA or HSLA. And before I leave you, uh, there is one weird trick about parsing CSS colors, which you can use if you want to make any tool that uh, accepts CSS colors or input. For example, one of uh, I used uh, this trick when I made this tool that converts any CSS color uh, into RGB, hex, and HSL. And instead of having to parse every possible CSS color that the browser supports, which as you will see, it will become even more complicated in the future. You can just create a dummy element, set its color property uh, or any color property to that color you want to parse, check if the browser retained it, otherwise it means it's invalid, then get the computed style, and the computed style will always be RGBA or RGB. So you only have to parse one color format instead of all the possible color formats. And with that, um, thank you very much. Hope you learned something. My slides are online here. And the slideshow framework is on my GitHub here. So thank you. I hope you learned something today. <laughs>